welcome to the fifth sunday after pentecost and the theme for our worship today is the authority of christ's messenger is based on their living contact with him very true as long we has living contact with our lord jesus christ who is a living god definitely god eyes will be turned upon his people some is in psalm 22 verse 27 says let all the ends of the world be turned unto the lord and let all the families of the nation worship before him that's the greatest hope we have to the ends of the earth and we continue to maintain filled in lord's presence the psalmist says that may you be filled with the pleasures of the house even in the holy temple so let us adore and praise god as we experience his living presence which is dwelling at the ends of the earth till he come back in glory he is there he is in control even under covid he is there he is present with us let's seek his will let's seek his promises let's seek his action in our lives so we have a pleasure of being with him in his temple and in his household let us worship a dog as he sing praises to him Let's look to the Lord in prayer. O oh God, you desire all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Grant that as the first apostle was sent out by your son, so in his name the church may continue to heal the sick, support the oppressed and announce the good news of your love. For him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and ever. Amen. The responsive reading this morning has been taken from Psalm 65 verses 4 to 8. Please respond by saying, Thou art the hope of all the ends of the earth. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness. O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of all the farthest seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. They that dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy.
first reading is taken from the book of Kings, 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 19 to 21. 1 Kings chapter 19 beginning to read from verse 19. Elijah left and found Elisha plowing with a team of bullocks. There were eleven teams ahead of him and he was plowing with the last one. Elijah took off his cloak and put it on Elisha. Elisha then left his bullocks, ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye and then I will go with you. Elijah answered, All right, go back. I am not stopping you. Then Elisha went to his team of bullocks, killed them and cooked the meat using the yolks as fuel for the fire. He gave the meat to the people and they ate it. Then he went and followed Elijah as his helper. This is the word of the Lord. Please respond by saying, Thanks be to God. The second reading is taken from the book of Acts chapter 4 verses 13 to 22. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above forty years old, on whom this miracle of healing was shoot. Here ends the second reading. Thanks be to God. Oh 
The Gospel reading has been taken from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 3, verses 7 to 19. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan, and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him, to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John, to whom he gave the name Bonerges, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading and hearing of his word. In that intercession, let us join our prayer for the whole human family with the unceasing prayer of Christ our Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray for justice and peace in the whole world and for the fullness of life for everyone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who live in this place, for the removal of all that divides us from each other, and for the true harmony in our country, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all engaged in agriculture, industry and commerce, for all workers skilled and unskilled, and for all those who defend our country, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For teachers and students, scientists, artists and writers, and for all who influence the minds and hearts of others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who are suffering, the poor and hungry, the destitute and the oppressed, the unemployed, the sick and the dying, and for all who help them, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all to whom authority is entrusted in this and other countries, especially for our President, the Prime Minister, the Chief Justice, the Lieutenant Governor of Delhi, and all who have power over other people, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the unity of all Christian people and for their witness and service in the world, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For your whole church in our country, for its councils and leaders, especially for P.C. Singh, our moderator, A. Dharmaraj Rasalam, moderator of the Church of South India, 
and G. Burgess, Mar Theodius, Metropolitan of the Mar Thomas Church, for Varis, our Bishop, for Timothy, Dennis, J. Kumar, our Presbyters, and our lay leaders, Ashish Samuel, Anurag Smith, and for all other ministers of your church, that they may be faithful in their ministry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That with all your people who have faithfully served you in this life, we may also share in the eternal joy of your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Is an heavenly Father the coming of your kingdom and grant these petitions which we offer in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The confession of sin. Beloved, our Lord Jesus Christ said, The Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us therefore confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved by God's grace to keep his commandments and to live in love and peace with all people. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against one another in thought and word and deed, in the evil we have done and in the good we have not done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in the newness of life. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who forgive one another and truly repent of their sins, have mercy on you. 
pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. We'll share the peace. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Let us pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Good morning everyone let's look to the Lord good morning everyone let's look to the Lord in prayer our dear Heavenly Father we just want to thank you for being so good to us and especially this morning as we gather together to worship you we pray Lord that you would be with us help us Father God even as we hear your word that Father God our hearts might be richly blessed by it and we can continue to be your disciples be with us Lord all this we ask in Jesus name Amen so the theme that we have for this morning is the authority of Christ's messenger is based on their living contact with him. The authority of Christ's messenger is based on their living contact with him. So, so we want to take a look at a passage which is there in Mark chapter 3 and uh, it has been read to us and let's just read a little bit of it again. Okay, and uh, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted and they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. So this is the passage that we will be focusing on and we want to understand how the authority of Christ's messenger is based on their living contact with him. So if you just take a look at this, what was happening, Jesus was on a mountainside and he was preaching and he was teaching and he was driving out demons. He was healing the sick. And in the midst of all this, he did something um, different. Jesus called to him those he wanted. So there, uh, this is what some people might uh, understand as the second call. Because uh, these 12 were already following Jesus. But they were in a crowd of maybe 100 people or more. They had been witnessing his miracles, they had been learning from him, they had been knowing about God from him. Okay, So they were all a part of the crowd and they were all in it together. But here, Jesus calls them personally by name. And why does he call them? It is mentioned right here in our text that he called them to be with him, he called them to preach, he called them to have authority to drive out demons. And we will explore each of these things a little later from now. But uh, what important thing that you want to learn from this thing is that first Jesus called to him those he wanted and the response, they came to him. They came to him. Now this is 
important because uh, you may think that that if God calls, who would not come to Him? If God calls somebody from a crowd, people who already know Him, why wouldn't they come to know God? But we have instances where many people did not want to come to God. All right, and uh, so they came to Him. What what do we understand by they came to Him? In Matthew chapter twenty-two, verse t- verse fourteen. Uh, our Lord says, For many are invited, but few are chosen. Many are invited, but few, few are chosen. And now what does it mean? If we just take a look at the statement, it would think that uh, God has called so many people, invited everyone, but He picks and chooses whom He wants to choose. Okay, that is a very Calvinistic uh, theology that God already has those in mind who has, whom He has chosen and whom He has already uh, chosen to be saved but that is really not what the Bible teaches for example this passage for many are invited but few are chosen let's take a look at Matthew chapter 22 verse 14 okay so the context is that G that this king he tells a parable and in this parable this king told his servant that the banquet wedding the wedding banquet is ready but and but the people who were supposed to come to the banquet did not come so he said those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you can find. So the servants went out on, on the street and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well, well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wearing clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king said to his attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. So what do we learn from this passage? It seems that everyone was invited. And people did accept the invitation and they did come. Or in other words, everyone was chosen. But there was one person in this uh, parable who unchose himself. If there is any word called unchose, let me use it here. He unchose himself. He was asked to come to the banquet, but he came to the banquet on his own terms. He did not meet the requirements. What what requirements are we talking about? He did not honor the host. A person would dress up to honor the host. He did not do that. He wanted to enjoy the perks, but on its own terms. So many are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. And uh, God wants to choose everyone. Everyone. But then, we undo the good work that God is doing. We do not honor Him in our lives. We do not do what God wants us to do. And we just want to enjoy the perks of being a Christian. This man wanted to just go to the banquet, enjoy himself. Everyone was invited. Everyone was chosen. But he chose to uh, not. He chose not to honor the host. And that was his undoing. He wanted to just enjoy the privileges. But didn't want to actually get down to, to the business of following the master. That is sometimes uh, what you and I do. We, we get interested in the Bible, we get interested in God's cause, we will become Christians, we start to attend church, and then when we are serious about God, then God tells us to do something specific for Him. God calls us out and tells us what He wants us to do. He puts a burden in, in our heart. Some of us ignore that burden. They say, no, 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 my family, my life, my money is more important. I, I just want to to uh, follow God at a distance. I don't want to get up up close and dirty. They, they would have none of it. In fact, uh, there's a, a family I knew, a good believing family, so I thought they were, and they asked me one day that, you know, the daughter is getting off age, if you can find a man who is uh, a believer, and said that, you know, we don't want somebody who's uh, too much into hallelujahs, who's too much of a charismatic believer, just someone who just uh, goes to church on Sunday because we don't want uh, someone who is truly into God, you know, because such people are missionaries, they won't have a great future. 
Mm. Yeah. Perhaps you and I are thinking, or you and I fit that description. We are just on the edge. We are just observers. We just observe Jesus do all the miracles. We observe at a distance what Jesus is doing. And when Jesus invites us and says, Hey, I want you on my team. Come and do what I've been doing. Then we just want to shy away. No, Lord, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty much over here. I'm happy here. You may have your moment of comfort. You may think, oh, great. I'm, I'm just on the border of the kingdom. I'm enjoying all the perks. I don't want to get my hands dirty. But what happened to this guy? Hmm? In the parable, the king says, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now this uh, imagery has been used many times in the, in, the, in the New Testament and it is not talking about hell. It is outside in the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is a lake of burning fire. It is not hell. This is someplace else. What is this place? Darkness. Outside, outside of where? There should be something inside in order for something to be outside. The out inside thing that is being assumed here is the kingdom of God. It is the millennial kingdom of God. The, the heavenly city of Jerusalem, the perfect square, you know. And to be outside of that because there, uh, there will be doors which will, which will allow people to come in and go out. So there is some inside and there is some outside. And there are some people out in the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why weeping and gnashing of teeth? Because they will realize that, oh my goodness, I was so close to getting in. All I had to do was to just listen to that call of God. All I had to do was just obey Him. All I had to do was to kick off that old habit. I didn't do it. And the person who did it, they are in the heavenly city. They are living with God. I'm outside in the darkness. Mm -hmm. It's a privilege to be called by God and it's something that all of us, all of us can experience. If you just follow God close enough, God will put you someplace. God will certainly have His way in your life, provided that you must allow God to have His way in your life. Okay. Now, the question arises, why only 12? Why were there 12 people? Well, 12 people because uh, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, we read that, Truly, truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on His glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So these 12 apostles are basically the replacement of the 12 tribes of Israel. According to the Abrahamic covenant, Israel was to bring about God's blessings upon all nations. Jesus pronounced his judgment on the keepers of the law. He pronounced judgment on the temple and all of that got destroyed. AD 70. Now the world would be saved through the acts of the apostles. So the 12 Apostles are a replacement. The people of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, were supposed to be a blessing on earth. The way how God would channel His blessings on earth was through the people of Israel, but they failed miserably. They did not adequately represent Him. So now, what's happening? The 12 apostles have taken their place. Now the blessings, the gospel, would be preached through those 12 apostles, and we know that happened. What the apostles did, they preached the gospel, they wrote the gospel, and the gospel has been instrumental in bringing the world to its knees in repentance before God. So the blessings of God has finally reached people of the earth through the apostles, through who people had, uh, through whom God had called. Okay, so let's take a look at the next thing. Why did Jesus call them? As I said, we will be discussing this a little later. Why just did Jesus call them? Jesus called them to be with Him. First, Firstly, first and foremost, to be with Him. The best training one would receive is when one closely observes his master at work. 
you know how John became a disciple? Okay, when we take a look at the Gospel of John, verse 35 onwards, we read that the next day John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? He said, Come and see. They came and saw where, where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah. All they had to do was be with Jesus for a couple of hours, spend time with him. They came up with this, this conclusion that this guy is the Lord. This is the Messiah. Yep, that is the Messiah. That's so the best uh, on the job, hands on training Jesus gave us uh, when the disciples would be with him. So they would have observed that, the, uh, that Jesus is spending his time preaching and teaching, but more important, he's spending a lot of time praying. And they would have observed what he was praying, they would have seen what he was doing, they would have seen how he closely connected he was to the Father they'd learn on the job. And that is what Jesus wanted to teach them. It's a something that you can't preach about, something that you can't really tell everyone. You need a close, you need people to observe you minutely, closely. And he chose these 12 to do that, to observe him minutely, closely, and, and come to their own conclusion that the man that they are following is none other than God himself. So the text here gives us the answer why did Jesus call him? First, to be with him. Second, to preach. And we have just taken a look that they preached and they wrote the, their eyewitness account. And using that eyewitness account, the world has been saved. And then the third point, to have authority to drive out demons. What God, what Jesus was doing, he wanted his disciples to do. He wanted to give them the authority to drive out demons. And they did get the authority to drive out demons. Actually, if you just read the next couple of verses, uh, then uh, from Mark chapter 4, if we read on, then we know that after he had preached to all the crowd over there, after he had uh, exhausted himself with all the healing and all that was happening, he was extremely tired. And... In verse 35, we read that uh, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Okay, So there was a boat ready. He wanted to cross to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. And a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Now, why would Jesus say something like this? That, why are you so afraid? See, if we examine this passage closely, we, we get to know that the work of Jesus was truly growing. On the other side of the lake, he would drive a legion of demons. So perhaps the storm was caused by demons. The source may have been demonic, but the storm was real. How can Jesus just uh, uh, talk to the waves and say, waves be still? A wave is an inanimate object. It's a phenomena. It's not a living thing. But there was something else that was driving the waves. And the text makes it clear that demons were behind it. They were terrified of, 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 being, of being driven away. So they wanted to do something. Create a storm. Drown Jesus. And, and so Jesus having authority over demons. He was able to rebuke the demons. And the waves stopped behaving that way. And the sea was calm. And he was angry with his disciples because 
they fail to express their faith by exercising authority on demons. It should have been the disciples who sh should have recognized that, you know, God's work is happening. The person who is against God's work from, uh, from uh, being successful is Satan himself. And it is his ploy. He would have caused the storm. So let us use the authority and let us calm the storm. They did not. After being with Jesus, after uh, Jesus calling them to be disciples, after Jesus giving them power to drive demons, still they failed the test. And so Jesus said, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? It became a matter of faith for them. Yeah. That's what happened. Jesus wanted his disciples to exercise faith, to drive out demons what he had told them to. So what does this uh, passage tell, speak to you and I? This passage tells us that, that God has, uh, that we, we must have been attracted to God and we would have come to God. But once we start to walk with God, once we start to read the Bible on a daily basis, once we start to pray with Him, once we begin to have a meaningful relationship with, to God, then God would really want us to be with Him. God would, would give us a call and God would uh, make things happen in my way. He would lead me and guide me into something great for His kingdom. Okay, And maybe there is something like... Uh, there are, you know, some prerequisites be before he can use you. Okay, like this man who had been invited to the banquet, he did not wear party clothes. He wore his ordinary dress. That was not acceptable. So in the same way, when God calls you to work for him, he expects something out of you. Maybe there is a sin in your heart that God is prompting that that sin should go away. Maybe you're addicted to something in life, alcohol. It could be anything. It could be uh, the wrong source of thinking. It could be your indulgence in a worldly pleasure of any kind. Who knows? But God, whenever you read the Bible, God would make you feel uncomfortable about it. And he would want you to change. But then we love our sins so much that we do not want to change. We love our old habits. We love our old lifestyle. And when we do that, we are just working as observers and observing what Jesus is doing, what God is doing in this world, what God, how God's kingdom is expanding, but we have no part in it. We are, we are just at an observer stage. Whereas God is always knocking at our door and asking us to just have faith in Him, take a step of faith and start to work with Him. And then he will give us authority and we will we'll be working for him. But that doesn't happen because we unchoose ourselves. We believe in God, but we want to believe in God in our own terms. We don't want to make the necessary changes in a lifestyle that, that is a prerequisite for working in his kingdom. And so we deny ourselves the privilege of serving the master. God has spelled it out so clearly for us. He wants us to work for Him. He wants that. But we unchoose ourselves. So what I want to uh, speak to you and speak to myself is that whatever it is that God is prompting you in your heart today, be obedient to that. That is what God is expecting you to leave, that particular sin, that particular lifestyle. And God wants to use you. God wants to, uh, to use you for His kingdom. But you are denying God the opportunity by being forever unqualified with this unchanging heart of yours. Don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. You know. We need that power to uh, God's, God's kingdom is powerful and God's people who are of God's kingdom are powerful. But somehow, if you feel powerless today, it is because 
there is something which is wrong in your heart and you don't want to change it. Don't let that be your story. The poor man who got invited, got privileged, but but was kicked out. Don't let that be your story. Okay. God empowers his people. The authority of Christ's messenger is based on the living contact with him. And that is what God wants us to do. Live in close unison with him. Live with him. How do we live with him? When we read God's word on a daily basis, do study, and when we communicate with God on a daily basis, we are living with him. You know, my father had, uh, I, I, I often used to go to my father's office during his uh, holidays when I was, uh, during my holidays when, when, when I was a school kid. And uh, I found it so interesting. My father being the boss, he had his, uh, his cubicle. I'd be playing around somewhere. And every now and then I would hear my father calling out to his secretary. And the secretary out of fear would run into my father's office with a notepad and a pen. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Yes, sir. What is it that I that you want me to do? I don't think she ever entered without a pen and a notepad because she had a job to do. She had to enter into uh, the boss's office, take instructions regarding what she ought to do. OK, so, you know, I find it quite uh, uh, sad when people just wake up in the morning, go to the balcony, open, uh, read the book of Psalms and uh, read the Bible, read a Psalm and then quietly pray for a minute. Done your devotions. Hey, come on. You're spending time with the boss. You're spending time with your master. You got to write the instructions what the master has told you to do today. Whenever you read God's word, something will hit you. Something will strike you. Your heart will be challenged. You need to write it down. What is it that the master has told me? What is it that the master wants me to do today? That there should be a diary. There should be a notebook. Somewhere where you can write all these things down. Otherwise, it's pointless. We are just observers. Unless we take God seriously and do what he tells us to do, we cannot be called his disciples. We are just observers. Okay? So let this not be a church of observing people who just observe God, do and clap our hands at a great distance and say, good job, God, I love you, God. Thank you, God. God wants us to get down, get our hands down and dirty in his kingdom. Don't just observe God. Don't just marvel at what Jesus did. God wants us to do what Jesus did. Jesus wants us to be his disciples to do the very things that Jesus did while he was here on earth. And that is what you and I have been commanded to do. So let nothing come in the way of that. May God bless you and may God be with you even as we uh, ruminate about what God has told us today. Pastor had asked me to sing a song and uh, I will sing that song after the final hymn in the service. So don't turn off your uh, service once the final hymn is over. After the final hymn, I will, I will sing a song. I found a track and I, it's, it's one of my favorite songs. It's about a pledge. I made a pledge before God and I would like you all to make a pledge even as we hear the words of that song during the end of the service. Thank you. Let us all affirm our faith and say together, we believe in one God the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. Through Him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died and was buried. On the third day he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated 
at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism of the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings go. Praise Him, all creatures and below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God. the holy trinity make you strong in faith and love and defend you all at all times and the blessing of god almighty the father the son and the holy spirit be with us now and ever amen go in peace to love and serve the lord let us all say together in the name of christ Amen.
my life is a gift that I can give you. All of my life now is yours, whole and complete. All of my hopes and my plans carefully laid in your hands. This is my pledge, cause you mean the much to me. All of my life is a gift that I can give you. All of my life now is yours, whole and complete. All of my hopes and my plans carefully laid in your hands. This is my pledge. Cause you mean the much to me Right or wrong, the past is gone The pain was strong, the road was long But now I'm in a whole new avenue But now I see the hope Picture of eternity Going where I've never been A brand new chance to start again All of my life is a gift That I can give you All of my life now is yours Oh, I'm complete All of my hopes and my plans Carefully laid in your hands This is my pledge Cause you mean so much to me All of my hopes and my plans Carefully laid in your hands This is my pledge Cause you mean that much to me This is my pledge Cause you mean that much to me